Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Laura Vowles. She is an ICEEFT certified emotionally focused therapist and a junior lecturer slash postdoctoral researcher at the University of Lausanne in Switzerland. She has published extensively on topics pertaining to romantic relationships and sexual desire and well-being, and those are the topics we're going to focus on today. So, Dr. Vowels, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to everyone. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's very nice to join you today as well. Thank you. So, um, I mean, let's start with this. What is the relationship between uh, sexual satisfaction and relationship satisfaction? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think time and time again in research, we find that those two are very closely correlated, which means that usually when you're you're satisfied in your relationship, otherwise you're also satisfied with your sexual relationship. That's not always the case. Certainly clinically, we have couples where they're like, oh, we're really good. We're really happy. We're best friends. We're just not having sex. So we do get those couples, but I think on average, on the whole, when couples are satisfied, they are satisfied in, in different areas of their lives. Um, and on average, people tend to correlate very highly. Um, but there are also people where, where otherwise things are good, but sex just isn't that great um, as well. But they are generally very closely linked together. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, what does sexual satisfaction mean in a relationship exactly? Does it have anything to do with the absolute number of times people have sex? I don't know. Does it have to be a minimum number of times per week, per month, whatever? Or is it just that whatever the number of times each partner prefers to have sex, they are more or less in sync? For sure. So I think there is a relationship between kind of sexual desire, sexual desire discrepancy and sexual satisfaction, but those two things aren't actually the same thing. So sometimes people can be kind of satisfied with how many times they have sex technically, but they're not really satisfied with the quality of the sex. Or if both partners, like neither of them actually want to have sex, their sexual satisfaction might actually be quite high because neither of them don't want it. So they're completely happy with that. Um, so it's, yeah, the, the relationship between kind of desire and, and sexual satisfaction can be complicated at times. But I think a lot of people, when you ask them first, they think about how often they're having sex and are they having sex often enough. That tends to be the first thing people associate. But then when we measure sexual satisfaction, we don't really measure it in terms of how often you have sex. It's more about are you satisfied with your uh, mm -hmm. sexual relationship overall? So we measure it slightly differently academically. But when you speak to lay people, it tends to be like, oh, we're not having enough sex. Like That tends to be the first problem. Um, but then when you probe people a lot more, most of the time it's not about how much sex you're having. It's about whether your needs are being met in the relationship overall. So when we seek sex from our partners, sometimes we seek it because we just want to feel satisfied and it feels physically nice. But a lot of times we also seek it to feel closer and to feel connected, to feel accepted by our partner. So there's lots of reasons why we might seek sex and actually physical intimacy and like physical satisfaction tends to be quite a small part of it. Um, in terms of how often we should be having sex or shouldn't be having sex, um, everyone would love to get like, oh, once a week is great, it's an optimum number. And actually we have some research to suggest that that is the case. Um, I wouldn't trust that one bit because that might be the average number of times that some people have sex, but that doesn't mean that it's the right thing for you or it's the right thing for your partner or it's the right, right thing for your neighbors next door. Like it's, it depends entirely on their relationship. I think some of the recent research has shown that around 25% of couples aren't in an, a sexually active relationship with each other actually. So about quarter of um, couples don't have sex. They, that doesn't mean quarter of the couples are really unhappy with their relationship or with their sexual relationship either. They may just have their affection and intimacy needs met in other forms and other ways. 
Um, and also depends a lot on our definition of sex because if you define sex as kissing, maybe couples kiss like five times a day and then they have a very good sex life. But if you measure it in terms of you have to have intercourse for 45 minutes, not very many people will set, like actually be able to achieve that physically, even for men or for women. So it's it's very complicated, I think, and very much depends on the couple and which then that depends on what you learned before and your prior experiences and what you think you should be experiencing. And that's often very different to what actually people do experience. But is it in general problematic if people report sexual discrepancies in their relationship, either in terms of them being satisfied with how they make love or in terms of the number of times, for example, one of them wanting to have much more sex than the other or something like that? I mean, is that always really a problem? No, not always. Um, it depends a lot on the couple. So I think sexual desire discrepancy is just a normal part of relationships. And sometimes you're really tired from work, but your partner wants to have sex or the next day your partner is too tired, but you want to have sex. It's impossible for two people to be wanting same all the time, the same way at the same time. Uh, so you just, you can't do that um, in a long-term relationship, maybe for the first month, but surely like when you go back from the honeymoon phase and like life returns more or less normal, you just can't um, do it at that point. So that in and of itself is, is normal and expected in a relationship and there's not really any problem with that as such. It's just when it becomes more chronic, so then you start having one person who always wants more sex and one person who always wants less sex and neither of them are satisfied. Um, so when you become kind of more rigid in those patterns, that's when it usually becomes more problematic. Um, but also just because one person's level of desire is kind of higher it doesn't mean they will always be higher and it also doesn't mean that the, it will necessarily be a problem for the relationship but it's more likely to be if it's always the same mm -hmm. does the need for sex change across the relationship and is that something good bad neutral i mean or is it just a normal thing mm -hmm. um Yes, a short answer is it does. Uh, I think it changes for most people and the most couples. It's not always the case. Um, obviously, in when we do like statistics and and research, we tend to do averages, and on average, um, it's a problem, blah blah blah. But for a single individual, like when I take my therapy hat on, there's always an exception to the rule, which we don't see in in the averages for, for statistics more so in qualitative research a little bit. Um, but, sorry, I completely forgot your question as well. Uh, I was asking if the need for sex changes across yeah, the relationship. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there is most, I think most people um, have more sex when they first get into the relationship because it's that kind of honeymoon phase and you can't get enough of each other and everyone's kind of, um, jumping to bed and can spend hours in bed and exploring and it's all fun and new and exciting. Um, it's not sustainable because we can't spend six hours a day in bed because we have other things um, to do with our lives. Um, not that everyone does that at the start of the relationship either, but usually it's not a sustainable level of sex. It's just kind of the first bit that you do and most people kind of settle onto some normal, which oftentimes over time trickles down a little bit and um, becomes slightly less. Um, I think sometimes people, like some research suggests that for women it goes down quicker or it goes down before men it doesn't. In my experience, at least in therapy, um, it goes down for both people, but it's just whenever the discrepancy becomes that one person always wants to have sex and the other person never wants to have sex and that never wants to have sex is usually the woman, not always, but usually if there's a problem. Um, but when you ask the couple, they usually want similar amount of sex. It's just either the sex isn't very good or they've stuck, gotten stuck in this pattern. So there's lots of reasons why um, some people like sex kind of goes down. 
but also the newness and excitement's gone. So it's almost like you discovered a re- like your favorite restaurant and the food was amazing and you go there every day for the first month. At some point, it just starts to taste like normal food um, and it's not something special and it's not something amazing and it's not something new anymore. And it might still be your favorite restaurant. You might still want to go there, but you might start going there once a week or once a month rather than like every day or breakfast, lunch, dinner kind of thing. So it's like with everything, you get used to it and then you just have a bit less of it. So at a certain point there, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that you mentioned that when one of the partners doesn't have to have as much sex as the other, it's usually or more common to be the woman. So are there important sex differences here? Um, Depends on who you ask (laughs) in terms of researchers. I think overall, like if you take just average men and average women, women tend to report slightly lower um, sexual desire levels than men on average. But if you take couples then some research has suggested that the man or the woman both have equal chances of being the higher desiring partner so in in a relationship context it's a lot of times not that way around I would say in my practice it's slightly more than for the man to be the higher desiring partner Um, than the woman and I also work for a sex therapy app called Blue Heart and for our users I would say maybe two-thirds of the low desire partners are women and one-third are men so and that's roughly what I would say in clinical practice as well Um, but it's not always it's maybe the 70-30 kind of ratio or 60-40 Um, with men more often, the high desire, but not always. Mm -hmm. What are the reasons people usually give for not not wanting to have sex with their partner? For not wanting to have sex? Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, there can be lots of reasons. I think most common is just like, we went in a mood, we were tired, we just laid on the couch and it didn't happen. Um, kind of thing or either tired or stressed or we just went in the mood kind of like general reasons or or it's the or my partner didn't want to even though I want it either they went in the mood or they didn't like uh, I don't know they were busy with other stuff or they weren't around um, or sometimes they have experienced pain during sex or um, that kind of thing so there can be lots of reasons why people don't want to But I would say the most common is more just kind of like, well, and the day-to-day just didn't happen because we were busy with other stuff. Mm -hmm. And what are the reasons that are problematic in terms of, for example, pointing toward uh, a possible negative future for the relationship or uh, lack of relationship satisfaction or something along those lines? Mm. I think I would say that when people start to point fingers, um, so they say like, oh, it's always my partner. My partner just doesn't want to have sex ever with me. Or um, the other partner goes like, oh, no, it's me. I just don't ever want to have sex. So it's kind of that, uh, like, when is not, oh, we as a collective unit didn't feel like it, or we together decided we didn't want to have sex. It's more the kind of, oh, it's my partner. Or, yeah, I just don't want to have sex. Um, Kind of like, yeah, the finger pointing is when things get complicated. Mm -hmm. So uh, are there any good strategies to deal with uh, sexual desire discrepancies when uh, they impact relationship satisfaction? Yeah, there's definitely some strategies that are better than others. I think in some of the research that I've done, generally what we find is that when you do something with your partner, um, your relationship satisfaction tends to be higher, your sexual satisfaction is higher. So it doesn't mean you have sex with them. Sometimes you might just because you want them to feel good or you're kind of neutral about it. Um, but it might be that you, I don't know, go to cinema together instead, or maybe you cuddle on the couch for a while and watch a movie together or 
um, maybe you do something alternative sexually in instead of the kind of your typical um, sexual relationship or you have a conversation about it and agree on, on what kind of next steps are. So it's generally the kind of partnered activities that um, make you feel closer and more connected with your partner and that's at least fulfills some parts of part of that need. Like you might still want to have sexual intercourse because of the physical satisfaction and gratification. But if you have a really nice cuddle and you feel really close and connected with your partner, you might be kind of 70 to 80% there anyway without needing the intercourse part. So that, that can be really helpful in relationships. But often what happens with when people have um, distress in their sexual relationship, or everything goes out the window. So you have no affection, you avoid kind of kissing or hugging because there's a fear that this will lead to sex or this will be frustrating for the other partner. So you just don't do anything. And then your kind of desire or wanting to feel close to your partner goes from like 100% to when like when you're having sex and close and cuddling and affection and everything to like 0% because you don't do any of that together. Um, that 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 is kind of the difficulty. But we, when you are still doing something with your partner, um, you tend to be more satisfied in the relationship. But if you just wait around and do nothing, uh, that tends to be quite negative for your, for your relationship satisfaction and sexual satisfaction. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if this is a fair question to ask because it probably runs both ways. But I mean, do we have any idea in terms of where do issues really stem from? I mean, when things start manifesting in the sexual domain, do they tend to start there? Or do people usually start having other relationship issues that manifest in the mm -hmm. sexual domain? Uh, and then, I mean, uh, things start feeding on each other, let's say. I, I mean, w do we have any idea where it starts exactly, if it's really in the sexual domain or somewhere else? I think it start, can start with anything. Um, but I think any issue that you have, if it kind of gets left untreated, it snowballs and gets into further problems. Um, if we give like a physical health example, like, I don't know, you've got like my mum at the moment, she's got a heel that's really sore and instead of um, resting it and staying in bed for a time for it to heal, she's still walking on it. So the next thing she's going to have a problem with is going to be both the heel and now the hip because she's going to be walking funny. So it's kind of the same idea, like you can have something in the relationship that isn't going very well. If you don't address it, and with sex, we tend to not. So when sex becomes a problem, we kind of put it there like, oh, let's just not address it. Let's not talk about it unless it's a massive argument and then it blows up. But that's not talking about it. That's arguing about it. And those are different things. So if you don't address, you're just like, oh, it'll go away on its own and ah, it'll be fine. It's not a big deal. We have, we're busy with building a career and having kids and all of this other stuff. Um, then it tends to kind of seep into other areas of your relationship. But you can also, like, obviously, if you're not getting on with your partner, oftentimes the first thing isn't for us, like, we don't first think about, oh, I, need, I really want to have sex with them because I can't stand their face. Like, it's just not usually the case. Sometimes some couples say like, the only thing that keeps them together is the sex. So there are different functions that the sex kind of fulfills. Um, and sometimes it can be the only thing that's good. Sometimes it's the only thing that's bad for some time. But I think if left untreated, problems tend to escalate rather than get better on their own. And when they escalate, they escalate into other areas, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you think, um, let me put the question this way. Uh, how often and when do you think a partner should talk about their sexual life when one of them is not satisfied with it? Because, I mean, as you, as you mentioned here, there might be just some contextual, contextual issues, like, for example, being overworked or stressed mm -hmm. or, I mean, things that are external to the relationship itself and then uh, the other person might be might not be satisfied with it but just think okay so let's see if this goes away and things get back to normal i mean 
is there any moment when people should really, even if there's other issues external to the relationship, they should really uh, address the issue with their partner? Yeah, for sure. I think the exact time is difficult because, I mean, I've had couples where they haven't like addressed it for 40 years um oh my god so <laughs> it's, it's a long time or they address it like very intermittently during that period of time and it's decades um, until things like actually get better um so i think the time is some, somewhere between that um but it's very tricky to say i think it's more about how you're addressing it rather than when you address it um, obviously, Ben, as in like, don't address it when your partner's about to fall asleep or run out of the door because they're busy and late for a meeting. It's just never going to go well. Um, but I would say it's more about like how you're addressing it. So don't address it. It's like, oh, you never want to have sex with me. And this is a massive problem for me. And I'm going to leave you if you don't have sex with me. That's not going to help. Uh, it's only going to put the pressure on the partner and make things worse. Um, addressing it more in terms of like, oh, I've noticed that we are having less sex um, now. Um, is there something that would make it more exciting for us? Or do you think that there's something else going on um, in our relationship or, or in our lives that may be making, it, um, making us have less sex? If you say you're not having sex with me, that's immediate defense and that's it. Um, case closed, usually, or massive argument. So it's definitely better if you can frame it kind of as a we problem, like we are not having as much sex. What can we do about it? Um, and easier said than done, but um, that is generally the better way of addressing it. And you, if you present it in that way, you can address it whenever because you can say, oh no, in the last couple of weeks, we haven't had as much sex as we were doing before. Is there something I can do to help you? Are you feeling stressed or is something else going on? Or what's happening in the relationship between us and that kind of thing. So that you can address at any time really. Um, but I would say don't wait too long because a lot of times couples just wait, 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 wait. And sex is one of those problems that when you get into this kind of avoidance cycle, it's more and more and more difficult to then address it later on. So sooner the better usually, if mm -hmm. you do it in a nice way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, we've been sort of focusing here, on not explicitly, but more implicitly on uh, uh, heterosexual relationships. But I mean, does this work the same for people with other kinds of sexual orientations, like, for example, bisexuals, lesbians, gays, and others? Um, similarly, yes. I think, again, we probably see more, um, like, differences between people than between, like, specific groups. Um, and there's a lot of overlap. So I would say, like, broadly speaking, um, it's quite similar. I know the kind of... Um, like societally we have certain stereotypes like there's this like lesbian bed death like lesbians don't have sex kind of thing which isn't true um or that gay people cannot be a monogamous and they just have lots and lots of sex with lots and lots of people all the time again not true um and it may be true of a subset of people but it's certainly not true across the board um, and I think bisexuals also kind of get the same stereotype of like, because they like both men and women or um, across genders, um, then they kind of, they can't stay faithful to one gender and one partner because they will always want the other. Again, not the case for everyone. There may be some um, bisexual people that prefer to have multiple partners because they, they can fulfill kind of both attractions or different attractions. But that's a subset of people that's not people as a whole. Um, so I think on average, people are definitely more similar than different in terms of between groups. Mm -hmm. Does a bisexual identity impact sexual and relationship satisfaction in mixed couples? Um, yeah, so this is a study that I uh, did a couple of years ago with a colleague of mine. And what we found is that when 
when a bisexual individual has quite an, quite negative beliefs about themselves uh, or about their bisexual identity, not necessarily themselves, but as a, as a bisexual person, they had lower sexual and relationship satisfaction. Um, but when they had, like, we measured bisexual identity both as kind of the negative domain, so, like, internalized, like, bi-negativity um, and that kind of stuff, and also more the positive elements of, of um, bisexuality, like, bisexuality allows you to feel more intimate to people or bisexuality and being bisexual allows you to feel more authentic to yourself. Um, the positive dimensions are generally associated with kind of positive outcomes, so higher relationship and sexual satisfaction and the negative with, with negative consequences. So so we do find this pattern, um, at least with some, some of the kind of bisexual um, identity pieces, um, but I think there's that kind of like if I feel good about myself, I feel better or better able to open up to that part of me and to, to my sexuality as well. Mm -hmm. So I want to change topics and ask you about uh, sexual values, but just before that, uh, just one last question about sexual satisfaction in relationships. So. Uh, do you think that, for example, if you have uh, someone who has a high sexual drive and his or her partner has low sexual drive, do you think that uh, it can be helpful in any way for the high sexual drive person to try to compensate it with other things like, for example, using pornography or something like that? Or do you think that it can have a negative impact on sexual and relationship satisfaction? Yeah, sure. I think with uh, masturbation and porn, um, it gets complicated like with everything else. <laughs> But usually if you're open about it in your relationship and you can talk about it openly and it's an agreement between the two of you, i.e. one person, person doesn't identify that as a, as a form of infidelity because if they do, that's probably going to have negative consequences or if they just don't like it. Um, but in couples where they openly talk about masturbation, where it's okay, whether it's when it's within the bounds of their relationship, including like watching pornography, because you don't watch porn just to watch porn, you masturbate to porn, um, generally speaking. Um, so kind of that area, it doesn't have to have a negative impact on your relationship in any way. It's the secrecy that has the negative impact. So if you are... <coughs> um, hiding it, if you're not talking about it, and if you are just going and, and masturbating because uh, your partner just said no and you're feeling resentful because they said no and you're just doing it to kind of compensate. And masturbation and sex fulfill quite different functions for most people, but where like masturbation is much more about the kind of physical gratification um, and kind of getting to your, know yourself. It's, it's something private to you. It's something that where you can feel completely safe in yourself um, and explore your sexuality. But it's not about connection with your partner because you have no partner in, in that um, relationship. So when you're masturbating, you can't fulfill the same needs and desires that most of us want to fulfill with sex. So that kind of needs for closeness and connection and affection and like expression and play with someone. So they, they're not the same thing, um, but it really depends on, again, the openness in the relationship. If it's something that you're doing by yourself, hush, hush, and have to hide, then it's usually negative for the relationship. But in an open relationship, it's not. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what are the sources of the formation of sexual values? I mean, where do people derive their sexual values from? There's loads of different things, but in studies we tend to um, use kind of certain categories because it's, it's easier for us to kind of put them in certain categories. Um, a lot of it we get from media, obviously. Um, we get it from our upbringing, so what our family thought about it, whether our family talked about it openly or not, whether we got sex education. So I did my master's in the US and a lot of it is still abstinence only. So you can imagine the values that you hold about sex if it's really bad and it's going to kill you or get you pregnant until you're married and then you're supposed to either have it because it's your duty or because you have to have more children. So that person who has that kind of sex education is going to have very different value system to 
unless they've worked through it to someone who's had kind of comprehensive sex education where you talk about pleasure and the positive elements and relationship building and all of that as well. Um, you, in a lot of religions, sex is viewed as something like dirty and really bad and that also can have a negative impact. Um, but also especially when you're teenagers like teenagers talk a lot um, and you get that kind of peer influence um, and relationships it, they don't usually talk about it very openly and honestly and candidly um, especially uh, like you get these like men or boys chatting about um, all kinds of stuff mm. um, but those those values are still going to be kind of coming and seeping into your relationship um, and finally your your romantic partner like how your romantic point of view is the world and their sexuality and, and their sexual experience is going to have an impact on you and, and vice versa too. Um, and probably the longer you've been in that relationship, the more of your values also come from that romantic relationship. Mm -hmm. And here, sexual values, we're talking about uh, what exactly? I mean, the values you have about the sorts of uh, sexual relationships you want to have or also how you look at for example other sexual orientations and both like yeah both you I think you can have um, like obviously we have values about everything um, whether they're implicit or explicit it's, it's a different matter um, but it can be about like, yeah, I, it, am I okay to be attracted to just my opposite sex or can I be attracted to the same sex or different genders? Mm -hmm. um, how am I allowed to be attracted to someone? Can I have sexual urges? Is sexual urges bad or good for me? How, what is okay to have sex? How is okay to have sex? Like there's, um, and can I masturbate? Like there's all of these different kind of areas within um, sexuality that you have kind of the value system for. Um, and you might be able to kind of paint it with a big brush and be like more conservative versus more liberal, but there can be, you can be like more liberal in some areas than other areas, for example, as well. Do you know if it has anything to do with uh, individual traits, like, for example, personality traits or something like sociosexuality? Um, so, yeah, I think sociosexuality um, is something that people have looked at more recently, but I think it's quite closely associated with like, your values rather than something that's intrinsic to you. Because when, when we talk about something that, like, like personality, we talk about something that even with babies, they have different, we call them temperaments when they're, when they're babies. Um, but they like some babies cry more, some babies cry less, some babies want more attention, some babies want less. So we do have these, not necessarily innate, but very early developing personality characteristics. We're not very sexual as babies. We might touch ourselves and masturbate even um what that means different things to babies obviously to, than to adults but even babies like touch themselves and it's usually kind of a comfort thing um so but the sexuality itself doesn't usually develop until later on so things like sociosexuality is usually kind of coming from the the values and expectations that have been kind of instilled on you that becomes like a trait like thing later on but it's more amenable to change because it happened later, if you, um, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, do you know if there are any major differences between men and women when it comes to the sources of their <laughs> sexual values? So some of the research that we did, uh, we found that men tend to be more likely to kind of get their values from media and from their peers. Um, and I think that kind of goes more in that kind of like with men, that kind of comparison. Like I was talking um, at work with Blue Heart today about kind of different types of like sexual dysfunctions. And I think for men, like having an erectile problem is a massive like manhood masculinity thing. Like I'm somehow less of a man if I can't perform. Uh, whereas for women, it's kind of like, well, I mean, women can perform technically because they don't have to have an erection. So it's easier for them to just kind of lie there. Um, so I think for men, you get more of this kind of comparison to like media and to peers kind of 
arena. Whereas for women, it's actually more on their romantic partner. So if they're like, and what they experience in that relationship. So it might be that their romantic partner is like really high in their sex drive. And then the woman feels like, oh, I can't ever measure up to that. I'm not good enough. Or they're like, oh, my romantic partner is really open to all of this and really happy to explore and can help me um, kind of get out of my shell kind of thing or, or anything like that. Or they're open to my exploration and, and sexuality, which can help you open up even further. So I think there's, there's a slight difference in, in the genders um, in terms of what we find in the research or found um, mm -hmm. in that. Uh, are these sources the same for people with other sexual orientations, uh, apart from heterosexual, of course? Um, no, mostly. Um, there's very little differences. Um, the only difference that we found that was significant was that gay men were more likely to look to their peers um, for for the formation of what they're kind of supposed to be as, as gay men, which I think still goes to the same like masculinity and men kind of looking to others for that guidance. Um, and I think you less likely to go to media because like at least some time ago, because there wasn't much on gay sexuality there. So peers is where you would get that information from. Um, and that tends to be more uh, where you go for that. Uh, as a gay man, at least it's what we found in our sample. Mm -hmm. Well, I would imagine that people's personal sexual values would have an impact on their sexual and relationship satisfaction. Is that right? Um, so we find some, like um, some of the like sexual values or where they where they're coming from. Um, are associated differently with uh, relationship and sexual satisfaction. I think there's probably some third variables there. So, so for example, if you get your values from, from religion, um, your satisfaction tends to be lower, but that's usually because the religious values tend to be quite negative um, in terms of sexuality. Um, and I mean, also media, the portrayal is quite unrealistic. Um, as opposed to like if you get your sexual values from like a romantic partner and the value system is, is quite positive and it's more around the kind of closeness and connection and intimacy, then that's going to be better for your relationship satisfaction and your sexual satisfaction than, than having these kind of historical um, sex is bad because it's really hard to be in a, in a good relationship um, and satisfied with with your sexuality and your sex life if sex is bad fundamentally. Mm -hmm. uh, when you mentioned that the, the media tends to be unrealistic because we're focusing on the sexual side of things, are you talking mostly about things like pornography or are you also referring to just how romantic relationships tend to be portrayed on the media in general? Yeah, so I was actually talking just about like general media, like how relationships are portrayed. I didn't even think about pornography, but of course pornography is like any media is not meant to be realistic. It's meant to be TV. Um, but I think somehow people forget that because it's humans. Um, but like if you watch a movie about aliens like growing out of your belly, you don't expect to then next day encounter that um, on the street. The same way like same way as like rom coms, they they meet, they have a really tumultuous relationship, then a week later they get married and live happily ever after. Like when has that ever happened in real life and been happily ever after? Like never, it just doesn't happen. Um, I think sometimes with porn, we kind of think, oh, it's people having sex, so this is how we must be having sex. Um, it's not their actors and they're pretending. Sometimes they are enjoying the experience, really, but that's, that's not what they get paid to do. They get paid to look like they enjoy the experience. And it's cut a certain way um, from, the cer from certain angles to make the experience look as, as good at, as possible, but not necessarily realistic because there's lots of stuff that isn't in porn. So I think if you read the porn as in like, this is how my sex should be, it's not going to be. <laughs> if, especially if you watch like mainstream porn, it's just not going to be like that because we're not porn stars. Neither partner is a porn star. This is not going to happen. I mean, unless they are porn stars, but most 
relationships that's not the case um but in in again in in normal media as well i think it's just portrayed as something that's like very easy but you have this like real tension and you build the tension up like over subsequent days or at least during the day and that's what we want a lot of times especially like when i talk to women i'm generalizing but when i talk to women in in clinical practice they want this build up they want this kind of like in the morning we kiss passionately and then we go away from each other to go work and then we send like suggestive messages or I wore like really nice lingerie because then I'm thinking about like the experience that I'm going to have and then we have a like, really nice time and flirting and all of that. That's what we see in romance novels and erotica and like romance books and all of that. So that's what women are socialized to expect. <laughs> Men aren't because they grew up on four. Um, again, generalizing, boys can do both, but um, most men aren't doing that uh, when they seek um, uh, and trying to initiate sex with their partner. So the reality of um, the sexual relationship and the expectations are often quite different. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about one last topic, uh, COVID-19, the pandemic, and how it might have impacted uh, relationship satisfaction. So did it have an impact there? Yeah, so there's quite a few studies that have obviously come on this now. Um, we've written several papers on the topic as well. Um, and in the study that we ran, um, we found that there's about a third of the people that for whom it was worse, third of the people whom it was better, and third of the people that kind of stayed the same. Just as a caveat, this is only the first like month and a bit of the pandemic. So we don't know the long term impacts of the mm -hmm. pandemic that are having in the relationship based on this research. But there are clear kind of trajectories um, that people are taking. So some people just are worse off. Some people are better. Some people um, just kind of stay the same. Um, and there are like some people's lives didn't change that much, right? I mean, they may have seen less people, but sometimes they didn't see that many people to start off with and they already work from home and they don't have kids and they don't have all the kind of things that make COVID very challenging. Um, or like their relationship was already quite good. Um, so that can kind of help carry them through. But if you had problems in the relationship already and all of a sudden you're locked in a studio apartment for two years, it's not gonna go well, <laughs> um, generally speaking. So there are kind of certain kind of risk factors and, and uh, resilience factors, we call them. So things that make you uh, more likely to um, succeed and, and do better. Um, and when we talked to people, um, um, I did interviews with um, 48 people, I think, at the start of the pandemic. And some people were really saying, like, this is really bringing us closer together um, because I can't imagine anyone else in this world that I could survive this isolation with than my partner. So there's this, like, newfound appreciation for your partner. Um, and it was certainly like my husband and I, I'm so glad that he happened to be my husband and actually our life didn't change massively and we were, we were quite like happy at least for the first six months after that um, COVID was a bit arduous, but it wasn't having an impact on our relationship because we already had a good relationship and we already spent a lot of time together. We went all of a sudden like going from two hours a, a week of seeing each other to seeing each other all the time. Um, so I think there's there's diff like different reasons why people did better or worse, but they, not everyone got worse during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, would you say that if the pandemic have any sort of impact on relationship satisfaction, that the way we have to look at it is uh, how the relationship was already going and how people built their relationship instead of really just the factor of spending more time together in close quarters, really having that much of an impact in their relationship? Yeah, I think for a lot of people, there's already kind of the threads that we're kind of running through. But there are other factors there that um, may have really tipped the balance during COVID. Um, so, for example, there there are some couples that 
like they kind of do like perfectly well when they have limited amount of time that they spend together they can be quite happy and quite content um, and they kind of focus on work and then they have nice time when they're together but then when they like when you put them in a confined environment where they don't have as much space when they're in just pockets all the time it just doesn't work for that relationship um that that can be difficult but that's like a direct result of the covid because it's different kind of relationship to how they had it before um or some like for certain like some people especially if you had kids like it was really tough and you had to negotiate things even more than you had to before because before maybe you had a nanny and the nanny watched the kids like from eight till five um every day and you didn't really have to negotiate any of of, of it because you were, went to work and then you spent time with kids in the evening but now you can't have the nanny at home or didn't now things are a bit better but at the time of the study like you couldn't have the nanny come over anymore and take the, take the kids away or you couldn't go to nursery or they couldn't go to school so all of a sudden you have to decide which one of your work is more important because you can't do both at the same time um and who takes a kid and when and what meetings do you have and when and like if you didn't necessarily have those negotiation skills already um and all of a sudden you go from like 20% need to 100% need it's quite a shock for the relationship um so i think it depends a lot on on also like what factors there are like kids and and work the kind of work you do and um how important social life is for you those kinds of things mm -hmm. but uh, anyway just generally speaking we probably can't say that the pandemic had generally a negative impact on relationship satisfaction. I mean, we shouldn't expect it. Overall, I, at least what we found, like the average actually stays the same, right? Because you have third of the people that got worse, yeah. third of the people that got better, and third people stayed the same. So the, on average, it's the same, right? It doesn't actually change to people on average, but that's where we get to this kind of like on average everyone's fine and everything's okay but there are people that are really really badly off and then there's the people that are doing really great um but we don't generally worry about them because they're doing great and they're fine and they don't need help it's the the third of the people um that if we just say on average everyone's fine so don't worry about it it's not it's not very helpful because there's the third of the people that actually are really struggling and really need support and help with that um and obviously part of that was um again maybe less so now but at the time like on government to provide alternatives and options and there really wasn't much there especially and like, when i was um early covid i was still in the uk um and we just it was just like you know i'll see anybody you are confined in the home there's no nurse there's no schools there's no support whatsoever at all for that then they later on they had like support bubbles where like grandparents could look after the kids and that kind of thing so it got a little bit better um but early in the pandemic you really didn't have that support and for the couples that would be struggling or have five kids at home all of a sudden like it's really tough um and those people definitely could have used some more support there from mm -hmm. the government yeah Okay, so Dr. Vowels, uh, where can people find your work on the internet? And probably you want to mention also Blue Heart. So. Yeah, for sure. So my website is uh, lauravowels.com. So you have um, not necessarily the most updated publications always, um, but you can obviously find more information on myself, um, both therapy and research. Uh, there's also a link to Blue Heart, um, which I mentioned earlier. You can also, if you Google Laura Vowles, you find uh, my ResearchGate profile and my Google Scholar profile, which has all of the papers listed there. If um, the paper isn't available and actually want to read it, um, you can email me and ask me for that um, and my email address is pretty much everywhere so I'm quite easily found I think generally. Um, Blue Heart is blueheart.io and it's a sex therapy app specifically meant to help people who struggle with um, kind of mismatches in sexual desire um, and the program that we have is actually based on um, what I would do in therapy with couples so it's a combination of emotionally focused therapy 
um, which is focusing on kind of understanding the negative patterns that I alluded to a little bit. It's like one person's kind of going, oh, me, 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 more, 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 more. And the other one's going, oh. Um, so it's kind of like understanding where those are coming from, understanding what might be the emotional drivers underneath all of that. Um, so that's one part of the therapy program. And the other part is uh, what we call sensate focus therapy. So that's um, guided touch exercises that help you stop the avoidance and help you get back to kind of connecting with your partner um, sexually. So that's um, my other kind of passion project that I'm a part of um, that um, has been really good in, in being able to help couples reconnect and, and find their kind of sexual satisfaction and, and their desire for each other again. Okay, great. So I will be leaving links to all of that, including to Blue Heart's website in the description box of the interview. And Dr. Vowels, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for inviting me. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. And thank you for everyone that's listening as well. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like, hit the subscription button, all of those things you already know. And please consider supporting the show either on PayPal or Patreon. All of the links will be in the description box of the interview starting at $1 per month. So it would be a great help. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimir, Greg Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klink, Matthew Whittingbird, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollacy, Eric Alenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Rutger Vosbo, Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegger, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurbano, Simon Colombo, George Pinha, Phil Cavana, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Hugni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Kassan, Ivan Bodrenko, Al Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrandt, Oslem Bullut, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W., João Eira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Eden Solon, Romain Roach, Dremiti Grigoriev, Diego Lanonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rusmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostasevsky, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, João Linhares, Lida Cosmidis, I'm Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortes, Ursula Litzke, Denise Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy and Trader in NYC. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Stafiniak, Ian Gilligan, Luis Caetano, Tom Vangnagdam, Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Sardus France, Thomas Trumbull and Nuno Welder. And my executive producers, Michel Rzieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Quadriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.